This podcast is brought to you by Podcast Nation. You are listening to As a Woman, Episode 120, The Practice of Medicine with Rhoda Kuvaris. Welcome to As a Woman, the podcast hosted by fertility physician, Dr. Natalie Crawford, to educate and empower women. Each week, learn about your health, your fertility, and how they relate to your true self. Become a part of the community, fostering collaboration over competition, while learning how to authentically find your voice and amplify others as a woman. Hi, friends. Welcome back to the podcast. I am really excited to sit down and talk with Rhoda today. She has a public relations background, and she has been a the practice administrator and partner at IVF Phoenix. She sees the other side of medicine. So those of us who are physicians or providers, we focus on patient care. But the reality is there's a lot more to patient care than just taking care of patients clinically. The other things that happen inside an office make a huge impact on the experience that somebody has as a patient. And it is up to us as those who provide care to understand how all of these things intersect and how we can optimize patient care. I think you're really going to love this talk. So let's go. Rhoda, I am so excited to have you on the As a Woman podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. It is honestly my pleasure. I um, still remember the very first time I met you online and then in person. And I am so proud of you. And really, it's it's you're one of the few who allowed me to sit at a table of, of physicians and practitioners, and I'm not one. And I, I really appreciate it. So thank you so much for allowing wow. me to be here today. I love you so much. And I think that's the perfect segue to, we're going to cover a bunch of things, but I really want to start by this idea that women have to compete against each other in order to get to the top. And I know for myself, and my colleagues, I know from our Pinnacle founders, we really feel like you are the embodiment of women supporting women. You show up, you support, you really amplify others. And I just want to know, you know, what kind of drives you in that? What lessons have you learned along the way? And how can we help inspire more women to come together in a community? Well, I think that women need to understand that they have more to learn from each other than competing against each other. And whatever discipline or subspecialty you are in medicine, patients are going to come to you for some unique abilities and things that you've procured in your own practice. But the reason that I was so overwhelmed to support things like Pinnacle, and I know you've got your new one coming up in May, and I really encourage, I'm sure you're going to sell it faster than by the time this airs, but is that women need to understand that there's a paradigm that has shifted in medicine. And what your mentor is teaching you today to do or how to do is significantly different when you become private practice and building your own brand and um, having the confidence and understanding the theater of medicine is something that's individually curated. It's not, um, it's not to be something that you compare against a colleague. I love that so much because it's really true. And I was just giving a talk yesterday with ACOG and I said, the people who are mentoring you are not up to date with what modern medicine is, especially in a private scenario. You know, academic medicine is lovely, but it's really different than trying to reach and connect with people outside of those big hospital-based institutions. And I think that how you present yourself, how you garner, you know, leadership abilities of others and how you support people becomes a part of your being. You know, one thing about Pinnacle is we've gotten a lot of female physicians asking us, why is this not a physician only meeting? And we have from the very beginning said, Pinnacle is not about being physicians only. It's about women in medicine supporting other women. That's been a part of what we've always been about. And you don't have to have this dichotomy between I need to go only with my own kind. We really can grow so much more when we bring different things and different perspectives to the table. Well, I think that the practice of medicine is amplified when you have advice and discipline and self-awareness around mental health, around the financial component of medicine, um, around the just the business of medicine, which is something that you don't get when you go to medical school. You get this either by hiring expertise and they don't really tell you 
they're not sitting in your clinic and understanding the process and how you're how you're transitioning a patient from the time that she or he fills out the new patient paperwork all the way to graduating in our in our discipline and going on to their OB. I think that it's important that people recognize that it takes 10 or 15 years to really hone your confidence and skill and have your cushion, so to speak, in terms of your savings and paying off your student loans and all the rest of it. But the collaboration portion is essential and nobody has all the answers. And so Pinnacle offers such a diverse agenda that not everything is going to pertain to you at the time, but at some point in your career, it'll become effectively something that you want to, to um, implement as being relevant where you are in your career. I could not agree more. You will love this. So at 2019, our very first Pinnacle, which you were there and supported us, I remember telling Pamela, hey, I mean, I don't ever want to own my own practice. I just don't want to deal with that. So we have to make sure we offer stuff to the people who don't want to do that. And, you know, as time has come, here we are and Fora exists. And the reality was, it wasn't that I didn't want to do it, is that I was afraid and I didn't necessarily know how. But listening to her talk and to Rupa talk and other people who have made that jump from being employed into owning what they do and having that control over the patient experience and your own life can make both the patient better and you better. And so I think that's really important that you may not be at that step now, but there's going to be little pieces and you're going to see from these other women who are accomplishing these really cool things, what's all possible and what's all out there. And that type of inspiration is just really so amazing. So I'm a huge believer. Pinnacles for any woman in medicine, and you're going to find something that resonates for you. And I tell everybody, I mean, Rhoda came, Rhoda's going to come again. I mean, that's just an embodiment that you don't even have to be clinically practicing medicine. And I honestly think we probably need more people behind the scenes because you control so much about what happens in your office. Probably you have so many opinions. This was one of my biggest transitions into practice out of training is just in training. You just do things the way they've been done because somebody tells you to. There's no variation. There's no opportunity for, you know, quality control or thinking through what might make it better, what might make it more efficient. And then suddenly when you're out in practice, you're either doing it somebody else's way that might make no sense, or somebody has to create the process. What is this going to be like from the moment a person decides they want to schedule an appointment? How are they going to schedule it? What are they going to do next? Who are they going to talk to? Is it going to be online? What's their paperwork going to be? Is it paper? Is it electronic? What happens next? Who do they see? And just thinking through the flow, that's been such a learning process for me and something that I just never had given that much thought to until we opened for about how important it's like the dating phase of a relationship is those first few interactions. Right. right. Well, I think that physicians are used to the metric of RVUs, but when you get into private practice, you have to address metrics to arrive at the RVUs. And that is, you know, how, and that's one thing that we did a lot at IVF Phoenix um, is I, I, I measure everything. I measure, I measure input. I measure how long, what was our um, fall off or what was our retention. But I also, re- I measure square footage in our practice. What is this particular room deriving in terms of, of opportunity for the practice and is it working in our flow and in our in our in our model of delivery and so physicians are so focused on production that when they go into private practice or become a partner in a practice the mindset has shifted but you haven't spent all those years trying to understand how did you arrive at that interaction i think that's essential and I, and pinnacle has great opportunities for that I think it's so important that you say some of these things that are in a perspective that we don't ever think about as physicians. I've never thought about what is the utility of this square footage and is this going, is making my money or is this space wasted essentially? Or do I need to do something different in this area? Or how can I utilize this to the best? And it was probably you. I was going to say, somebody told me, you know, it is really okay to make decisions based on money and to Mm -hmm. think about money and to think about how you do things to make money and what things you do that don't serve you, that don't make money. And one of the biggest ones in our field is seeing a patient 
that never does anything else with you, that never follows up, never completes testing, never does treatment, because that person took a lot of time to see them and use up that new patient slot and use your staff's energy to get paperwork and get them signed up and fill out consents. And then if they don't move forward to do anything, that's time not used well. So how do you get them through that junction and into something that's going to fulfill their goals of getting them pregnant and your goals of keeping the lights on and making money and paying your staff and not having to work like a dog all the time. Well, it's, it's no secret. Medicine is a case of diminishing returns. There's um, the narrow networks. There is the larger payers that want to pay you less and less and less for you to do more and more and more. So the lens needs to look on process and how are you doing something? And if a patient population is dropping off and not returning Maybe we need to look at the process and figure out why they may have fallen off. Um, And the tendency is to focus on the patients that are in the process because we're all so overwhelmed. But we would learn retrospectively tremendously from why this patient didn't return or why um, something happens. It can be a myriad of reasons. And so, um, you know, physicians have this... um, adversity in talking about money and understanding their value. And I'll be really frank with you. Patients don't value things that come for free. Yes. Right. It's so true though. And so I had, I had one patient say to me, well, you know, I just want to talk to Dr. Kavaris. I'm I'm kind of interviewing him. And so, you know, what do you mean there's a fee to see him? And I said, let me be really clear. The only uh, group or population that Dr. Kavaris talks for on a complimentary basis is our members of the press. If you want his expertise, it it's time. And that's just. That's somebody once told me or made some comment, you know, oh, you're just selling IVF cycles. And I always said, no, actually what I, what I sell is my time. My mm-hmm. time costs money. And that, that's what I sell here as a physician. That's what we all sell. We just let our time be worth so little. And we give away so much for free that we know that like an attorney would never give away that time for free. We know how much they bill. And yeah, as a physician, we feel this altruistic need to just be present at all times for our patients and give so much of ourselves to them, which I think is at the heart of why we all go into medicine, but it can, it can burn you. And I think you alluded to it, but we have to talk about what insurance companies are doing in our field and across the board in medicine, because they are diminishing our time and they're trying to, they're dictating care. They're saying what you can and can't do. They are. Yeah. And it's really at the patient detriment and patients aren't really aware of it because they want to use their benefit. Right. Right. I think that um, patients need to be aware when they sign up for insurance plans that this is going to impact how they receive care. So the insurance companies are dictating how and when. I mean, when when Dr. Kavaris got a letter from a big payer saying you spend too much time with patients and we're... ah, that's what. And so he asked me, so what did you do with that letter? I said I threw it in the trash, is where it belonged because, you know, there the person that sent it, as far as I'm concerned, didn't have a medical degree, and so they weren't in the room when you're making medical decision making, and you know what a terrible thing that he's spending time with his patients. So um, when, when you decide to go into private practice, and even when you're, if you're with a larger group or an employed situation, I think it behooves you to look at how the business of medicine is procured. Um, it's essential. It doesn't just arrive. The payers are leaning on all of us more and more. And they're also saying, and they're dictating how and when we provide care. So it's fascinating. We talk about this all the time at Fora, that we're not the Walmart of fertility clinics. And if you if you want the Walmart of fertility clinics, it is it is right down the street and I can give you the address and that's fine because maybe that will suit your needs better. But we're looking to provide a higher level service than that. How we do that is to see fewer people and to charge more money. And we're okay with that because people who value that interaction or that level of care will be okay with it. And we toy and we feel like we're on the edge of it. Of When do you stop taking insurance? When do you say that these people are paying so little and uh, it, they're even covering so little, they're dictating care so much. I see so many patients who've got insurance coverage, but they won't cover because they're lesbian or they're single or they have to do 
a thousand IUIs and they're 42 and it just doesn't make sense. So when to the point are we just spinning our own wheels? Do y'all ever have that conversation? Well, believe it or not, one of the very few uh, first surgical cases that we did in our surgery center was a patient who had a deductible of $99,000. What? Why was, even have insurance? You know, so Dr. Kabarks and I had a conversation and we scholarshiped her and we did her surgery for her because it's, it's an impossibility. I mean, there's an injustice in even creating a plan that has a $99,000 deductible. It's, it's ridiculous. So, um, you know, insurance is something that we battle with all the time. If you're in private practice and you don't know where your contracts are, or your contracts aren't loaded correctly, or you haven't negotiated, renegotiated your contracts, those are, you know, there's a whole checklist of what you need to do. And I think that the older the practice, the more comfortable they get. And, you know, I hear this from colleagues all the time saying, you know, so, so-and-so is our lowest payer and it doesn't even pay for our costs. In that situation, I'm not sure why you're continuing to take that payer. Right. I, I agree with you. And I think that it's okay to look out for yourself as a provider of medicine, as a clinic, and say that we can't, you know, we'll, what will we have to do is if we take this insurance and it doesn't cover our costs, we will have to charge the people who don't have insurance even more in order to right. keep the lights on. And that's not fair across the board. The other thing that I don't think patients are really aware of is how we'll use our field. I know this is happening in medicine across the board. I know it's big in dermatology and other fields, but in reproductive medicine, Mm -hmm. we are seeing such a rise of the corporate practice of private equity based clinics that really view the doctor as an interchangeable portion, right? Mm -hmm. And they try to streamline costs at the expense of a patient because they have a middle, they have their, you know, person who donated all their money, who they have to repay back to, they have to make sure. a profit off of. And we're really seeing, in my opinion, a lot of instances where care is being um, provided at a much lower threshold of, I don't know, good care, you know, because something has got to give when you have so many different chiefs that you have to kind of pay attention to. What, what's your take on this? So I tell patients this all the time that you you are making one of the most valuable and impactful decisions of your life is to grow your family. And um, there's a subspecialty called reproductive endocrinology and infertility. And it's a very rigorous subspecialty that produces less than 50 graduates a year. And so it is, if it was it was so easy to get into, we'd have more of them. But it is a very complicated process. Infertility is a disease, and it's not something that can be treated by um, independent satellites that have GYNs or that have um, just a PA or just a nurse practitioner. The delivery of infertility treatments is a consolidated effort. There's there are certain certifications and inspections that go on in um, in in our facility, as I'm sure it is yours. And you're also board certified or REI. And so, if and it goes back to the whole Walmart model. If if you are going to offer egg freezing for a thousand dollars, it's just not. I can tell you, it's just not possible if you're using the state of the art equipment and supplies to render a safe and successful cycle for a patient. And in order to adjudicate um, really authentic and um, responsible care, a practice has to like, so, you know, we have texting software, we have an online portal, we have all this technology to amplify the patient experience and access for information. We don't have an answering service. We, we, you know, we try and be as personable as possible. And humans are required to execute these jobs. And so it's not a throughput thing. There isn't a one size fits all. I mean, if I were to take it, you know, 10, 15 patients, they're all here for different reasons. So um, it's unfortunate. So private equity, you know, is rampant. They've gone into all subspecialties, not just reproductive endocrinology. Um, And I think the consumers need to understand what they're paying for. And um, those of us that are in private practice, um, we don't really intend to share our lane with private equity. Um, 
Dr. Kabaris is, I think, in a he's encouraged to see you and Dr. Skiller in, in this um, arena too, because you've been in that domain and you've seen what expectations are brought upon you. And you, it takes a lot of courage to say, you know what, I want better and I expect better and I think I can do this. And um, so we, we all applaud that. Well, thank you. I mean, it's it's hard to leap. I mean, I will say as a physician who's left terrifying, a couple sure. jobs, you know, but it is hard. And mm-hmm. especially when you get wrapped up with bigger entities that have a lot of money, they make the barriers to exit even much greater. And I think that that really does leave physicians stuck and burnt out in practices they're not happy at, but they don't feel like that there's a good exit strategy. And I always say, there's always an exit strategy. You just got to figure it out. Sure. But patients don't select practices because of private equity. They don't, you know, in in the realm of social media, I mean, there's comments about, well, you know, I'm sitting here in the waiting room. It's not our practice, but someone else's. I'm here in the waiting room looking at this massive chandelier. And now I know where my fees are going. So, you know, patients aren't choosing reproductive endocrinologists because of private equity they're choosing reproductive endocrinologists based on success and their personality and their reputation in the industry and um, physicians that are truly to their core want to keep doing what they are doing I agree with you 1000 percent I think that the private equity places disagree they think that it doesn't matter if they look bright and shiny and have good marketing that somebody will come to them. You know, I can even say that my name is being Google added to go to a different practice Mm -hmm. and which is outrageous. I mean, I was on the phone with Google people saying, how can they do this? But it's just a search term, you know? And so I think it's very interesting when you think of it that way, but I'm a big believer and I fought for the fact that no person, if they're looking for Natalie Crawford, MD, is going to get confused by not seeing me. Like I'm. Well, I, I think it goes back to Natalie to the whole um, where women are competing against women. I think that you need to be respectful that everybody has their talent, but a, private equity is there for um, a financial mm-hmm. reason, not because of medical decision making. And so, you know, there's the insurance companies telling you how they want you to practice. And then there's private equity telling you how you want to practice. And then the physicians caught in the middle about how they want to practice, but they've got these two opposing pressures. So, um, you know, for the young fellows who are joining um, practices or are looking to join practices, I think that you, you really need to look at the lens 10 years down the road and how do you want life to evolve for yourself? I think that's such a good point. Don't just look at the finite offer in front of your face, but really think about what's it going to be like and what are these downsides and explore them. And I think also the flip end of this for patients who are trying to find a fertility doctor is that this is, in my opinion, the most personal field of medicine that exists. The idea that you might not be able to become a parent, especially if that's one of your life goals, or those struggles that we go through with loss and miscarriage along the way, Mm -hmm. you don't have forever to achieve this outcome. And you want to know with full confidence that you're with a physician, a team, a clinic that has your back and your interest at the top of their pyramid. 100%. Right? Like that you are what matter to them Mm -hmm. and your outcome matters to them. And not just that, but your experience to try to get to the outcome matters to them. And so just like everything else, be a smart consumer. You know, you research before you buy something random off Amazon or, you know, you Mm -hmm. compare cars and which is going to be the best and you look at all their stats. Yet people will say, this clinic's the cheapest, so I'm just going to go there. And when does that mentality usually work out for us in other consumer processes? Right. And and I think for some patients, look, there is a finite dollar value in the pot that they can do treatment. But um, the the other thing I want to say is that I'm seeing contracts from, for physicians that um, are restrictive in terms of um, uh, covenants and distance. And, um, you know, there's all these things that they want to own and um, restrict you. And I don't think people understand that 14 years was the time that it took you to arrive at this juncture. And you lived a year, uh, all those, de- that, more than a decade of restriction and delayed gratification. And so, you know what? Have the confidence to carve out what you want, say what you want, 
and put your, uh, you know, you talk about, you know, what is your goal all the time in the world of reproduction? And I think physicians need to be very clear about where they want to go. And if they don't know, they need to be clear that they don't know where they want to go. So don't make a commitment that's going to keep you, uh, you know, tethered for five or six years. I couldn't agree more. And I think that we all want to have this rosy idea that our first practice is going to work out forever. Yet we do know that based on our field, at least, I think the number is like 70% of people leave the first job that they're at. And I think that just shows one thing that you said is that training doesn't teach you the business side of medicine. It doesn't teach you what it's really like. It doesn't teach you what you want. And you might not know your goals or how, what you need to achieve them. I'm a big believer too, that we need to break down all these secrecy barriers about when I got my first contract, I had no idea what goes in a contract, right? I had never been at a position and I hired some lawyer who's like, yeah, this looks good to me. Really didn't give me much insight. And I didn't have other people saying, well, this is what I got offered or this is what I had, or this is standard, or you should ask for this. And we have to, as a community, again, don't compete, but let's help each other. One of the biggest things that people get unsolicited advice about is their skin. So if you're tired of hearing that you should just wash your face at night or do this or do that, it's time to get some actual help. And there's a lot of buzz about what's right for you. But in my opinion, it's best to get advice from real experts. And that's why we're excited to partner with Apostrophe. Apostrophe is an online platform that connects you with an expert dermatology team. It allows you to get customized acne treatment for your unique skin. Through Apostrophe, you can get access to both oral and topical medications, things that are used clinically with proven ingredients to help clear acne. Simply fill out an easy online consultation about your skin goals. You'll have a virtual consultation, and then you'll get your own personalized treatment plan. Personally, I love how simple it was to sign up for your visit, the personalized treatment plan, and access to an expert team. We do have a special deal for the audience. You can get your first visit for only $5 at apostrophe.com slash A-A-W when you use our code A-A-W. That's a saving of $15. The code is only available to our listeners. So to get started, go to apostrophe.com slash A-A-W, click get started. Use the code A-A-W to sign up and you'll get your first visit for only $5. Thank you, Apostrophe, for sponsoring this episode. I tell every REI fellow right now, I said, you can send me your contract. Like, I don't, you're not working for me. I don't care where you go work, but the better your offer is, the better the next person's offer is. You know, we get this more fair offer together by thinking about, and it's not just about the dollar point again. It's really about what's your life going to be like? What are you committing to with that contract? What's the work environment? Do you really I know? Think, I think one of the other, you know, salient points is that if the, the intention is to bring you on as a partner, it should be in the document that you, here's the, here's the milestone that triggers you becoming a partner. And um, I think that if that's important to you, then it should be in the contract. And um, I've seen a lot of them where, you know, t- you do two years and, it's an unknown. Yeah. And I, I saw somebody who said, oh, trust is a two-way street. So we will offer partnership at this many years based on our discretion. Yeah. Trust what? has no what? currency in the legal domain. <laughs> I know. It has, it's like, it, has, it has nothing. And so the only trust really that should take place as a physician is between you and the patient. And there should be, you know, this cordial respect and trust for each other. And the moment that deteriorates, we know that it's not a good fit. But I I think women are, I mean, women in medicine, particularly in the reproductive endocrinology and fertility are so poised to do so well. And it's, um, you know, you look at people like Rupa Wong and Pamela Mehta and yourself and Danielle Jones. I mean, it is, um, it's overwhelming. And it's a certain, um, it's a certain expression of pride to see you guys all do so well. I mean, I'm, you know, 10 or 15 years older than some of you and to, um, to connect with all of you is really inspiring because I think that women particularly, you know, one of the things I have to say to you at the last pinnacle, I was horrified to hear the level of angst and anxiety that was associated with telling a mentor or a program director that they were expecting. Yes. Right. Like fear. 
it was, that was very um, disturbing to me. I mean, I think just in it, it's even more than that, right? Like, or that, you know, the, that fear you have to get time off this, that you're not going to please somebody, the inability or the fear of conflict, which I know is, is a real thing. I think a lot of this one m- men don't deal with at all, but it's rooted inside of us to try to be pleasers or peacekeepers or, you know, meet expectations. And so if we start to kind of go the other way and then it's amplified by misogyny in medicine mm-hmm. and people who take advantage of how you work and your work ethic, and then put you in those positions to kind of be angsty about going to right. a mentor. About thankfully, that. thankfully I'm married to someone who really th- thinks he's one of the girls. And so, <laughs> when, so when we see each other at conferences, he's like, well, can I go too? And can I have some champagne with Natalie? And so he really respects the, the, um, the contribution that women have played in medicine. But more than that, I think he's recognizing that he has a lot to learn about the, from not only the newer generation, but just the whole digital aspect of how the the delivery of medicine is, is going. And um, we all have a lot to learn. And I think that um, physicians have this um, stigma that um, they don't want to talk about money. So, or they're uncomfortable about talking about money, for example. So one of the cardinal rules in our practice is the physician doesn't get to talk about money with the patients. It's a, it's a, it's a no fly zone. The second thing is that, confrontation is um we deal with it very very quickly if someone is upset then or a patient is um you know feeling that they're not heard or something we try and intervene very very quickly but the physician at the end of the day this is his practice and so involving physicians in all the decisions not just financial ones are really important and and we're lucky that at our practice we've spent a lot of time working with our staff and we have tenured staff here 11 years seven years eight years because onboarding staff is Ooh, hard <laughs> well yeah you would know <laughs> it, it's a lot it's, it's a lot and it takes time to learn physician behaviors and patterns and um, it's important that you have a really good team to to execute that one thing that I have learned that used to cause me angst is I really felt this initial, and it definitely came from my work environment, that like I had to take care of every single patient, you know, no matter what, and try to cycle everybody. And really one thing, and this is Skiller and right, my partner who says, we, we are not for everybody and that is okay. And if a patient is showing us signs at the beginning that they are not liking what we are offering, we now say, we don't think this is the right practice for you and where can we send your records and being able to have that freedom of saying, I don't have to be everybody's cup of tea. And this is what I'm offering. I feel really confident about what I offer. I know who I am. This is how I practice medicine. If you're looking for something different, that's okay. doesn't have to be here. You can find it somewhere else. And that freedom of saying, it's okay to not have to serve every single person, right? There's a difference between service and servitude. And I think that everybody needs to be respectful, but the moment that gauge is released and goes off in a, in a trajectory that's not productive, then I will tell you in private practice, what I would suggest is as soon as there is something with a, with a patient that is negative and a potential situation, I do call malpractice and I, I record it on file because then the, the, the time starts tolling from the day that I filed the you know, awareness of the situation. Um, and they give you really good advice. And, and I think physicians need to understand that they can go to their malpractice for discharge letters and resources and the number of things that they have available. Their risk management departments are resources to you, not just for when, you know, a situation arises. So, um, and Skillen, Dr. Skillen's absolutely right. It's, it's not for everybody. And infertility treatments are not for everybody either. Yeah, I would love, I think you and I could sit here. I know for a fact we could talk all day. And, but I want to end by just asking you a few pieces of advice you have for people at different stages and at different situations. So let's start out with the infertility patient who is looking for a clinic. What type of advice do you have to say about how do you find a clinic or a doctor to go to? So first of all, I think that you should look at the physician's credentials. Um, In the world of infertility, there are practices that will not um, do diminished ovarian reserve or various other things because it skews their statistics. And um, frankly, 
Dr. Kavaris is not interested in that. He feels that if someone's going to make one or two eggs and they want to have a baby, that's why he got into medicine. They get the choice. We feel the same way, but your statistics suck if you do that. But you know what? That's about the patients. It's about the patient. And that's why he, he became a reproductive endocrinologist. So that's important. I think reading patient reviews is important, but I also think, you know, if there's no, there's a lot of us that will provide uh, free second opinions. But our parameter is that we're required to have medical records here so we can understand what we're giving a second opinion about. Um, so it's a, it's, it's not a trajectory. It's up and down and up and down. It's not an easy process, but I think you need to find someone who has, um, the credentials and that really I'm now contemplating on our website to put IVF Phoenix, which I trademarked because other practices were using them in their, um, in their marketing, but I'm now going to put an independently owned practice. Yeah. I think it matters. And, And I think, I think it matters. And I think it matters to the patients that they are going to be the priority. I couldn't agree more with that. And I think it's okay to, leave a practice. If you're not getting what you need, it's okay to get another opinion. It's okay to want to have a relationship with your doctor and your care team. And I think sometimes people need to know that those things are okay to say, I am going to send my records to IVF Phoenix and get that opinion and hear somebody else's perspective, because we all practice a little bit differently and have different personalities. And you want somebody who speaks your language. And we want everybody to succeed. It has to be a fit. And so Um, we know all of us, you know, people worry, well, you know, is that I want to transfer clinics from my, my embryos from another clinic, but he doesn't want to release them until I pay my bill. And will he do something to my eggs or my embryos? I don't think that level of um, sabotage exists. I think everybody wants everybody to be successful. And if you're feeling it's not a fit, I think they're also feeling it's not a fit. Agree. Okay. So advice for the person, we'll call her the woman who is a physician who's in a practice about, you know, leadership skills or interacting with staff, kind of office management stuff about how you interact with other people. Do you have any kind of advice for that physician starting in private practice? I would suggest that you um, carve out days to sit with your different departments and and see what they do in their job. So when I um, joined IVF Phoenix, I inserted myself in the billing department because it told me a lot about how the business processes, how they come through the door and what happens with authorizations and, and just the whole appeal process. And the billing department also told me about, you know, they did so many visits and then there maybe there was this drop off. And so I encourage practitioners to carve out time in their schedule to see in real time what happens for your employee on the lines. So spend two hours and sit at the front desk and see how, what it's like to, because you often hear physicians say, I don't know what she does all day. Well, I know you can't see what she does all day, but go find out, go and find out, go and sit, carve out some time. So you can see what kind of effort or the questions and the interventions that we need to deploy to help make the whole experience better more cost-effective and efficient. What advice, I love that. Okay, what advice do you have for the physician who is starting their own practice about how they can improve the patient experience? What's something that you've learned from your side of the office that maybe we don't think about when we're so focused on clinical medicine? Well, I think that when you become a patient, you know, for instance, if you went to your dermatologist and you looked at how you want to be treated and how you want the process to go for you. I think that's a good starting point. But if you're starting out in your own private practice, I mean, you you essentially know what you do like and what you don't like, and it comes down to the metrics of it. Collaborate with other people in your field and talk to them about their onboarding process. Talk to them about the software and the technologies that they have in place to help deploy a better, more efficient experience. I think physicians in, have had this tendency prior to certainly Pinnacle and, and other great formats that have helped um, advance the conversation is that it's okay to ask. And if you were to ask someone who is your peer or maybe someone who's in another state um, to about advice about what, you know, what can be done, I think they're going to be open to the conversation. I agree with that. And I, I want to elaborate on that with one more thought is that I think that it's okay to collaborate, you know, in your own town and to niche down even more to say, I don't do 
this fibroid surgery because I would rather send to this GYN surgeon who does a lot of those fibroid surgeries. And I'm focusing on diminished ovarian reserve and PCOS and these other issues. It's okay. You don't have to do just like you don't have to service everybody. You know, you don't have to do all of the things. Mm -hmm. It's okay if you want to, but if there's something that you don't do as much or doesn't bring you joy, it's okay to kind of take that out and say, Hey, these are the things I'm really good at. And niche down on that across whatever field that you're in. I think patients respect that too. We see plastic surgeons do this all the time, right? I'm like the breast person or like the body person, the face person. They all have their own little field. But I sometimes see that in women's health overall, people are more hesitant to sometimes do that. And I think that that's totally fine if you know what you like to say, this is what I like the most. I'm going to focus on these things. And I think, so at the end of each month, Dr. Kabaris gets all the patients and how they came in the door. And, and over the past 10 years, some months are really hard because, um, for instance, he writes a handwritten note to every physician that refers a patient. And some physicians will send three or four patients. And so he's like, well, can I combine them all in one? And I said, no, you need to thank them each for their referral. And I've been at the hospital, you know, having lunch at the doctor's lounge, and I've I've seen it firsthand where they're like, thank you so much for saying thank you. And I think physicians need to understand where their referrals are coming from and never take one for granted. Yes. I think, okay, that I will go back. That's the best advice for a new physician, especially if you're a subspecialist like we are, is that you can help your community by becoming friends with the people who refer to you. You help them out. You serve their patients better. And then that lifeline really kind of keeps growing as long as you nurture it. And by taking the time when you're not busy yet, because nobody knows who you are, to go out and meet those referring docs. And whether you're at the hospital or their office, or you take them coffee, or you answer a question, I always say, just give them your cell phone number. And I always say text, text me like, just, Hey, any PCOS question you have, or you're just not sure what to do. Just text me. No big deal. That goes so far Mm -hmm. by just opening the door and saying, I'm here. If you need support, even if you don't send me the patient, I'm here because then eventually they'll start to send other patients because they know you have their back and make them look good that you function as a team because you're collaborating together. You're not fighting for anything. You're working together. Well, one of the things I'm really excited about um, now that we're at the, you know, on the outside of all of this COVID is pre-COVID, we would, patients would say, I, you know, my water broke, I'm at the hospital, or I delivered. Can, and so there's been many weekends where we went to three hospitals to meet the babies. And so um, I think that's really important because we, we have to let go of the patient and they assume care with their OB. And so, you know, saying thank you. So I have him sometimes write to the, the OB and say, you know, I went and, I went and saw patient X and I'm, you know, I'm just really thrilled and thank you for taking good care of her. I think physicians, sometimes it's a thank, it's a thankless job and, and not enough people say thank you um, and recognize that you are absolutely human and, and it doesn't stop when you leave Fora. You are constantly thinking about this one patient who's struggling or having difficulties, and you're also collaborating with peers in your subspecialty to try and see, well, you know, what else can we do to maybe get her to having a successful outcome? I think that's so true, especially for our OB colleagues who really have it hard at certain times and with their job and the unpredictability nature of it, that just saying thank you can go a long way. Mm -hmm. I... Thank you for being here because I could talk to you all day, but I'm going to wrap it up. I do want you to tell people where they can find you slash IVX Phoenix, because I know you run the social media account. And then, you know, for anybody who's in your area, who's looking for an independently run clinic with a great physician and a good team behind you, how they can find you guys and reach out to you. And I just want to say, I love you tons and thank you for being here. And it's, it's the same. And so our handle is IVF Phoenix. And um, we're in Arizona. We've got an office in Scottsdale as well as the East Valley. And um, we have a significant uh, Canadian population, which as a Canadian, I'm very, very happy and proud of. And, um, you know, it's it really is day by day because um, we are small by design and um, we're, we have no intention right now to change that. Friends, I hope you really enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed recording it. We would love to have you at Pinnacle Conference. I'll give ourselves a little plug. If you are a woman in medicine, however you want that defined, we would love to have you. It is going to be at the Four Seasons Hotel in Dallas, May 20th through the 22nd of 2022. 
there will be COVID precautions in place. Fingers crossed things will be better. At that time of year in Dallas, there will be lots of outdoor events. But feel free to go to pinnacleconference.org to find out more information. As always, appreciate your support of the podcast. You can follow me on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD and check out the YouTube channel for more fertility education. Thank you. My name is Len Webb. And I'm Vincent Williams. We'd like to welcome you to our documentary podcast, The Class of 1989. 1989. Over the course of six episodes, Vincent and I will examine the importance of six black films that came out in 89 and how they shape and influence popular culture, filmmaking, and society in general. Come on, sucker. Let's get it on. New episodes will begin running weekly on March 6th. 